Hi, my name is Hannah. Today is October 12th, 2022, and I am calling this my last day as a fat woman. This video was basically born out of an existential crisis that I had a few weeks ago. When I cooked up the concept for this video, I was going to do a what I eat in a day mukbang slash vlog where I talked about my last day as a fat woman. The reason I say that it was born out of an existential crisis is because the previous day before I filmed this, the more I thought about that topic, the more I realized how foundation shaking it was for me. What I eat in this video is not at all representative of my actual typical daily diet, and I'll explain that during the video, but it is representative of what I was feeling that day. As the date of my weight loss surgery approached, and I grappled with the idea of losing my lifelong identity as a fat woman. This video is a bit rambly, messy, and generally unfiltered. I'll try to add some structure throughout by editing, but as I filmed my day, I tried to just let myself think out loud, open up, and share my thoughts and commentary on my experience as a fat woman. As a result, this video is also real, raw, and more vulnerable than I've been before on this channel. So I hope you enjoy my disorganized hot takes on my real life experiences and can possibly relate to or reflect on my commentary here. I started filming this commentary vlog first thing in the morning as I did my makeup before work. I'm gonna do my makeup while I talk about this. Not gonna lie, I was in a defensive mood. And this came somewhat in response to real life events, but also as a preemptive response to reactions that I could foresee from people I had met and people I had never met. I was afraid of what people would think about the fact that I was having weight loss surgery and how they would respond. Did I have any reason to be so afraid? Well, at this point, I suppose that's up to you, dear viewer. Let's get into it. So I'm going to be having weight loss surgery in two weeks from tomorrow. Tomorrow I need to start a version of a keto diet. And then on October 27th, I'll be getting a gastric sleeve. Um, to be honest, I have not yet officially announced this to my family. I think there's a lot of judgment around weight loss surgeries which is basically why I haven't said anything to most of them. I have talked to my sister about it, and I think my twin brother overheard that conversation because they live together. Part of what I want to do today in talking about my last day as a fat woman is talk about why I chose to do weight loss surgery instead of continuing my lifelong cycle of yo-yo dieting. I think that if people want to judge people who make this decision, it's only fair for you to hear me out as to why before you do so. Like I said, right out the gate, I was expecting judgment and felt the need to defend myself. Turns out that feeling was justified. After I finally told my family about the surgery, I learned that at least one significant family member had talked negatively about it behind my back. And of course, it was someone who would only be supportive to my face, so that always stings a little extra. But I bring this up to say, you would be right to think of my defensiveness in this video as me arguing with my family and answering for them the question of, why surgery? I have been chunky my whole life. I have been put on diets since I was, oh boy, as long as I can remember. Most of my family has struggled with weight our whole lives. Um, the only person who is not is my twin brother. And he'll say that he went through a period where he was feeling a little chunky. I never noticed. But um, yeah, most of my immediate family, my parents and two of my three siblings, have been obese at some point in our lives. When I was in middle school and high school, I remember being on diets all the time and just feeling so fat. And by the way, fat is not... I'm just going to take a quick detour. I'm going to call myself fat. Fat does not mean ugly. I don't think I'm ugly. I hate it with every fiber of my being when I talk to somebody thin and I call myself fat and they're like, oh no, no, honey, you're not. And I'm like, I didn't say I was ugly, bitch. There's this stigma around the word fat because I think that 
Skinny people don't like that word because they associate negative things with being fat. Um, I'm not losing weight because I think I'm fat and fat is ugly. I'm losing weight because my knees hurt, <laughs> okay? <laughs> my knees hurt, my body is not capable of doing things that it used to do, and I'm young and I want to reclaim my youth. That's why I'm doing this, okay? I don't think I'm ugly. Calling myself fat is not calling myself ugly. And when you hear other fat people call themselves fat, it's not fishing for a compliment. There's plenty of times when it's just being realistic about what I look like. Like, I have a lot of fat on my body. I know that. It's not a secret. <laughs> there was a minute when I, I did my first um, fashion show. It was an absolute disaster. But in preparation, I went to a fitting and I said something to the store owner whose dresses I was gonna walk about being plus size. And she was like, we don't call our girls plus size. We call them perfectly beautiful, voluptuous, curvaceous queens or something like that. And I was like, why are you a small person telling me a large person how to refer to myself? condescending as fuck, man. Anyway, I'm gonna call myself fat in this video, but when I say fat, I don't mean bad. I don't mean ugly. I don't mean anything other than I have fat on my body. And that's just the truth. <laughs> Skinny people, please stop policing how big people talk about themselves. Anyway, all that to say, I have always thought that I was fat for most of my life whether I was dieting or not. And that's partly due to like my mom always putting me on diets and that's partly due to me being bigger than a lot of my classmates. Or I would look at other fat kids and think that their proportions were better because they could wear shorts and I couldn't because I carried a, a lot of fat in my, in my thighs. And I always had chub rub. When I was growing up in the 90s to 2000s, aughts, the 20 aughts. Being fat was bad. It was not as accepted as it is now. I'm like a young millennial or very old Gen Z. I was born in 93. And depending on what chart I look at, sometimes I'm a millennial, sometimes I'm a zillennial, sometimes I'm a very old Gen Z. And growing up in the 90s and 2000s, there was a big emphasis on weight loss, weight culture. Every infomercial was about some way to lose weight. Everybody was very skinny, skinny, skinny in the media. Low-rise jeans were everywhere. But in a way, basically, I realized yesterday when I finally had my last appointment with my surgeon that there are things about being fat that I've held on to as a security blanket much more than I thought I did. I had a theory that part of why I was struggling with losing weight was psychological and there was something about being big that comforted me just because it was so familiar but yesterday it really like came out like i was crying in a sad way about the fact that i only have two weeks left until my surgery i was describing to my boyfriend in a way it feels like lopping off an arm because it's something that i've always known it's something that has always been part of my story part of my psychology is my weight and once I have this weight loss surgery and get my stomach literally changed for good, it's not going to be part of my story anymore. So my plan today is to show you what I'm eating basically on my last day of being a fat woman. Don't follow my example. What I'm doing today is not necessarily the good or right way going about this last day. Before tomorrow I start keto and then two weeks from now, get surgery. Not that I'm not going to ever struggle with weight anymore. I'm certainly going to have to stick to a specific regimen. It'll be easier for me for once because I'll have the new stomach as a physical assistant, a physical reminder not to have too much food, not to binge and overeat because I'm stressed. Like the new, the new stomach when you get a sleeve, if you overdo it, I, I hear, um, if you overdo it, you throw up involuntarily. <laughs> Your body just says nope and ejects that shit. My worst fear is being in public, feeling like I need to throw up and not having a place to go do that. So I am not going to be putting myself in a situation where <laughs> I am even close to feeling that urge 
I am very incentivized not to break the diet. And it's not even a diet. It's eat appropriate portions and focus on food groups that are actually good for you <laughs> instead of sugar. And when you have a sugar addiction like me, um, that is important. I'm rambling and I know that you, you've been to my channel before probably, you know that's how I talk. And that's my ADD for you, which is another reason why the surgery was a good option for me compared to continuing to diet. I'm tired of fighting the battle when I have covered by my insurance, state insurance, Medicaid, this option to, to like get one thing done and have this finalized solution that stops the cycle of yo-yo dieting and crash dieting like I did in college. I want to stop that cycle for the sake of my body, but also for the sake of my mental health. Oh, right. That's what I was talking about, why it felt like lopping off an arm. So much of my life has been focused on my weight, my weight loss. It's part of my personality. It's part of my conversations with my family and my friends. It's part of the Hannah brand, that I'm a big girl in a small world. And in a way, that's part of the familiarity that I'm leaving behind by not continuing life as a fat person. It feels like lopping off an arm because that's how big of a conversation it was and how big of a part of my life it was to be big. That's points of bonding with my family members that I'm not gonna have anymore. Although most of them by now have gotten their fitness and health in, in check. But it's still a conversation among us, certainly, even w when we are in our fitter periods. Part of it is like losing my identity and having to form a new one. And I think I realized that yesterday. And there is a part of this that's grieving who I was and realizing like I need to redefine who I am in a way that does not involve my body and my weight. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I'll be honest. So I'm scared about that. But it's just, it's nice to at least identify where the comfort feeling comes from. And then uh, hopefully I can start therapy soon and figure out how to solve that. I think that's what a lot of like fitness people don't realize. There is a whole process to the decision to lose weight. And a lot of times the reason that people fail on diets or don't choose to lose weight is that it's not just about people being lazy. It's about changes in your psychology and your social world. People look at me differently when I'm thin. People talk to me differently. Being big has been comfortable in that way because I'm not getting fucking catcalled on the street. But it's not, not getting catcalled is not worth sacrificing my health. I am so fucking late for work right now. There's more changes that happen than changes to the body when you lose a lot of weight. So when I say it's my last day as a fat person, it's not just my last day in this body at this size before I start drastically losing weight on keto and then surgery. It's also changes to my mind, things that I'm able to go do, feeling comfortable in certain places again, riding roller coasters again, sitting in any seat on an airplane. <laughs> and ultimately like that's a lot of change. It just is. Give people a little more credit. Weight loss surgery or whatever mode of weight loss you choose, it's never the easy way out. Weight loss surgery was chosen for me in conjunction with multiple doctors, surgeon, dietitian, people who have recently met me, people who have known me for years, people who are aware of my mental health, my physical health, all of my different healths <laughs> decided together that this is a good move for me. Where is my bag? I'm looking for my bag. I'm so sorry. So in terms of my last uh, day of food as fat woman, my breakfast is, I don't have time to eat breakfast because <laughs> I have ADHD and I uh, did not budget my time accordingly because I had the audacity to take a shower. For lunch, I will be taking my leftover Chinese from last night because I had a fucking binge last night while I was having an existential crisis about this very topic. Just kidding, I remembered that I had a banana and a coffee this morning. <laughs> Can I help you? Hi, can I please have a large mocha latte, but um, decaf, please? Yep, is it hot or iced? Hot, please. Yes, anything else? That's all. Your total is 450. You can drive around. Thank you. I promise I would only vlog in a drive through not while I'm actually driving. A lot of my process as I prepared for surgery had to do with my relationships with food. Not only food in general, but also specific foods. 
There were some temporary restrictions. For example, I have not had a sip of caffeine or carbonated beverages since sometime in June, and I won't have any for at least the next two months while I wait for certain parts of my stomach to heal. But there's a lot more to it than just restrictions. So I thought that a good place to start our conversation was comfort foods. Let's talk about comfort foods while I sit here and eat one of mine for breakfast. The thing about weight loss surgery is that it's not supposed to be that you never have foods that you like again. After the surgery, there's four weeks of healing that your stomach needs to go through, so you do have a very limited diet during those four weeks. After that, it's about eating healthy 95% of the time, and then that other 5% of the time, it's okay if you go to a birthday party, grab a slice of cake. At Thanksgiving, grab some pumpkin pie. It's not that you're supposed to never have these things again. It's that you need to limit your portion sizes, which is just like normal, normal eating. Anything super sugary or super fatty is not supposed to be a regular part of our diet. And I think that we all know that in our heads, but I think comfort food comforts us for like two reasons. And this is purely my thoughts, no science here, just my experiences. Either one, nostalgia, it is part of your family tradition to enjoy a certain food. For me, that's Mountain Dew and popcorn at night. And having that food makes you feel like a kid again and makes you feel safe, you know? This is all psychological. I also think that we underestimate the reality of sugar addiction. Sugar is a drug. If you're not aware of that, watch the John Oliver piece on sugar. I know that he's like political, but that piece has nothing to do with politics. It's all research. Sugar is addictive. If you love sugary foods and it makes you feel good, that's normal. It's supposed to make you feel that way. We've been hooked on this drug since we were little, especially those of us who are genetically predisposed to weight gain and enjoying sugar and predisposed to addiction. So when you're going on a diet, you're not just eating healthier now, you're breaking an addiction. If you can do that, be proud of yourself. That's an amazing feat to do with sheer willpower. Some people like me need medical help to do that. And when you add in that nostalgia piece, breaking the addiction is so much harder. It's not just a physical addiction, it's a psychological addiction as well. For me, Ben and Jerry's ice cream is an immediate connection to my boyfriend. Ben and Jerry's is his favorite ice cream. It's been like part of our relationship that on nights when we're feeling sad or whatever, or just like bored or even celebratory, we'll go get a Ben and Jerry's. After the surgery, after the healing process, when I'm back to like eating normal food, it's not that I can never have Ben and Jerry's again. I just can't go down a whole fucking pint. <laughs> what I need to do is get the, like those little cups that they sell and I need to listen to my body. If I start eating and my body rejects it or if I fill up after two bites, don't eat the rest of it. I think there's also a thing with me personally about wasting food and clearing my plate. I didn't want to throw food away. So I was like, I need to eat all of this. But then I also realized when I do that, I'm treating my body like a garbage can. If I'm eating food that I would have otherwise thrown away, isn't that what I'm doing? Treating my stomach like a trash receptacle? It's not. My stomach is there to receive nutrition for my body, not a bunch of extra shit that I'm eating out of guilt. <laughs> food waste is a huge issue, but you're not gonna solve that issue, that societal <laughs> epidemic by clearing your plate so that you don't throw away like a third of a serving of mashed potatoes or something. Also, you can save stuff for leftovers. That's a thing. <laughs> Growing up in a family with four kids, all of whom had food problems, it was a relatively big family in this day and age. So when a new food came into the house, it would be gone in like two seconds, especially because the boys had faster metabolisms than me and my sister. So there was this fear of missing out with food that came into the house. Like if I don't immediately run to get some of that, then I'm not gonna get any at all, or it's gonna be gone before I want it. So now that I provide for myself, I need to not think that way. But that has been a hard thing to get out of. I never really learned how to listen to my body when I was young. Being stuffed is a comfort food in a way too, because you know you're safe, you know you're fed. You know that you're so safe and so fed that you're satiated, you can't even take anymore. Being stuffed is usually a sign of a good time, <laughs> a party, 
Thanksgiving or Christmas, we may not intentionally eat to get that feeling, but at least for me, I never was able to recognize the difference to stop eating when I was full because I didn't know what that felt like. So I had to eat until I was stuffed. I hate feeling hungry, to be honest with you. There is a fear element to it that I don't understand about myself. I'm going to go to therapy. We'll figure it out. And that's the answer, isn't it? Not to enable bad habits, but to go to therapy and figure it out. And we'll talk about habits in a minute. But one way I like to think about comfort foods now, comfort foods, this ice cream full of sugar and fat, it is one of those friends that I love much more than it loves me. And I, as a person, I have a history of doing that. Trying really hard to make friends with people who like just don't really like me, or at least not nearly as much as I like them. And again, we'll work it out in therapy. But as yummy as I think this ice cream is, it is not doing anything good for me. It is full of sugar and fat. If I keep eating this way, I'll get a fucking heart attack. It is only adding to my stresses and only bringing me momentary joy, which might not even be joy as much as feeding an addiction and an emotional nostalgia. Now I can sit here and recognize all these things, but not necessarily feel like I'm able to stop, which is why I'm getting the surgery and working with a team of doctors and professionals because I can't do this on my own. I've tried and failed <laughs> repeatedly, but I'm giving myself one last day of comfort foods to say not necessarily goodbye to them because again, it's about moderation, but to change my thinking, I'm going to love them to the same amount that they love me which is very little. This provides me with good taste, good texture, maybe something cool on a warm day, but once it gets past my mouth, nothing it does for me is good. That's what I need to remind myself and that's what I need to make part of my thought process when I approach food. These friends that make me feel good in the moment but ultimately stab me in the back, I need to keep my distance from them. And that's what I'm going to be doing after today. And now, a word from our sponsor. Today's video was sponsored by me. Would you look at that? Okay, listen. I filmed this bit early in the morning when I was late for work, and I didn't realize how badly my dress was going to clash with the new floral wallpaper in the background. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's just all ignore it while I talk to you. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Did you know I have another YouTube channel? That's right. This originally was called my second channel because I also have a fashion, makeup, and lifestyle channel that I've been running since 2019. Now I kind of dropped it during most of 2022, but I just posted a video restarting it. If you want to check it out, it's called Pretty Hippie Me. The name is under advisement. I want to call it Hannah Needs to Something. Not sure what put ideas in the comments. That's the place to go for more kind of personal lifestyle, fashion and makeup and fun content from me. So on top of announcing the comeback of that channel, I also wanted to offer you an opportunity that I mentioned in my comeback video on Pretty Hippie Me. In the title, you might notice it says there's a giveaway. So if you like free stuff, listen up. As I mentioned in that video, I've decided to start a personal styling slash personal shopping business, which has been a dream of mine for a very long time. Ever since I grew up watching What Not To Wear, went to college, broke most of Stacey and Clinton's rules, and came out realizing I was okay. <laughs> Basically, I love the self-expressive, transformational power of clothing, and I want to help other people find their style and aesthetic and feel empowered to wear it with pride. So here's the fun part, the giveaway part. As I build this business from scratch, I'm offering my first 10 clients a free round of personal styling. So for me, that means an initial meeting to discuss what exactly you're looking for, a second meeting where after I have gone and done some online shopping, I show you pieces that I think would be good for you. And then a third meeting where after you've bought some of those pieces and tried them on, you can tell me what you think of them now that you have them in person and we can style some outfits together with them. Just a few details here. First of all, especially since I've talked so much about parasocial relationships on this channel, I want to make clear there is no pressure on any of you to enter this giveaway. I want it to be something fun that I'm giving to you, not something that you feel like you have to participate 
participate in. So seriously, no pressure at all. Secondly, when the business is up and running, it'll mostly be taking place virtually via Zoom meetings and stuff like that. So this giveaway will be open internationally, as long as you can work with my availability in my time zone. I will just ask for one thing in exchange for the free styling services. So it's not completely free, but it's also, I'm not charging money. It, basically, <laughs> I would ask that people who take me up on this offer would please submit some kind of a testimonial or a review of my services afterward, maybe some before and after photos. Most ideally would maybe even allow me to record their sessions with me so I can put that information together on my website. Basically, this is a portfolio building exercise. So it helps to have that kind of documentation of the fact that I can style people rather than just me saying it. But along those lines, just because you know me from YouTube does not mean that you have to lie to me. I want you to be honest to me and give me honest feedback during the process. That is the most helpful thing that you can do for me. And again, that's part of why I'm doing this process with the first few clients being free. So if you're willing to be honest with me, I am very willing to style you for free. A few clients have already taken me up on this offer, which I'm very excited about, but there are still spots left. So if you are interested in getting a style refresh from me, please email me ASAP at prettyhippieme at gmail.com, which is my email address for the other channel. And basically the first 10 people to get on my schedule will receive the free services. You will have to pay for your own clothes though. That's kind of standard, but it's, it's my work that's the free part. I'm not buying clothes for you. I can't wait to work with you soon. So that's the end of this, this the ad. <laughs> um, let's get back to the video. I can feel that sugar, man. <laughs> I haven't had that much sugar in one sitting for a while. But now that we're done talking about comfort food, let me, let's talk about habits for a minute. Cause I know that this is a big sticking point, obviously when it comes to weight management, weight loss, weight gain, whatever you want to do. And by the way, I made a video about this a while ago. I'll put the thumbnail up here. I don't remember what I titled the video, but at least the thumbnail says is weight loss body positive. And if I remember correctly, the conclusion that I came to is the point of body positivity is to accept and love your body at all of its stages from birth to death, whether you're fat or thin or young or old, curvy, straight up and down, you get plastic surgery, you get no such surgery, you get piercings, you get tattoos, you get nothing, you know. Body positivity is not just a thing about like accepting fat people. I say that because habits are a big part of weight loss, weight gain, weight maintenance, whatever you're trying to do with your weight, which is part of your body, hence body positivity is part of this conversation. Habits are crucial to this, w whatever your goals are with your body and with your weight. So when I talk about habits, I need to acknowledge the fact that I have ADHD and attentive type and habits are just much harder for me to form. They're hard for everybody to form, but I need to acknowledge that I struggle more than a neurotypical person would when it comes to forming habits, especially <laughs> habits that require me to give up things that on their face I enjoy, or at least extremely decreasing the portion size that you have. ADHD is attem attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, I will default sometimes to saying ADD because I don't feel very hyperactive, but <laughs> that's not what the H hyperactivity means in this case. It doesn't mean literally that you have to be bouncing off the walls. What I like to say when it comes to ADHD is it's not about a lack of attention. It's about too much attention. You're not like not seeing what's going on in a room. You're seeing everything that's going on in a room. You're hearing that conversation over here, looking at that thing out the window, hearing that music. All of those different stimulus hit you with the same amount of intensity as opposed to being able to filter out certain stimulus and ignore it so that you can focus on something that's most important, like the teacher at the front of the classroom. So it's more of an issue with regulating your attention. It's not lacking attention, it's regulating and filtering that attention. The type of ADHD that's really easy to spot and identify in children is impulsive or hyperactive type, where those kids who have all of these different stimulus are trying to react to everything all at the same time. So they're energized and they're bouncing off the walls and they're talking about this and looking at that and touching this and 
listening, you know, and, and they're very visibly, you know, kids like me who are inattentive type kind of get overlooked because sure, I'm sitting in class and I'm quiet, but I'm not paying attention. <laughs> What I'm doing is I'm hyper-focusing on something. Inattentive type people are more likely to internalize all of that not sure where to put your attention kind of energy. Grab all of that attention and hyper-focus it in on one thing. And you better hope to God that it's the thing you want them to focus on. (laughs) Because the thing that they're focusing on, all of their attention is on it. They're so excited about it. They're all in. They're in the zone. They're doing the thing. I do that like when I'm at work. I'm about to start working on some paperwork that I input into the computer. And it's one of my favorite tasks because I can allow myself to get into the zone like that. Just like snap through a bunch of paperwork that I need to input. But regulating that and moderating that and for example like when you're in that hyper focused state you lose track of time it's really hard to come out of that state and switch from one activity to another and it's also really easy to get into like perfectionism because you're just like you're in the zone so you're loving what you're doing and you're putting all of your thought and care and your best efforts into it. Inattentive type, at least to me, feels very all or nothing, very black or white. I may not be able to multitask well, (laughs) but God knows you give me one task to do, I'm going to do it so well. (laughs) So this is where this comes back around to talk about habits and forming habits. Again, speaking from my perspective with inattentive ADHD. Living this way is this roller coaster of like passion and then exhaustion. I do a task, whether it's something creative that I enjoy doing and that I give myself this task to do, or if I'm at work and I have an assignment that I need to complete, I pour all of my energy and heart and soul into it. And then when I'm done doing the task and I hand it in, or I publish a YouTube video, for example, I'm exhausted because I gave it everything that I have. That's how dieting is for me. I'm very all or nothing with my food. Moderation is so hard for me. I've learned a lot about how to moderate thanks to the few months that I've had of a more reasonable, sensible diet leading up to the surgery as opposed to what I was eating before. But what I was eating before was the nothing in the all or nothing. In this context, it would be like all healthy or no healthy. The no healthy version of Hannah (laughs) it's really bad. I eat so much sugar. I eat so much pizza and ice cream and like chips and cheesecake and popcorn. When I get into that zone, it's because I do not have the energy that it takes me to regulate my food. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of planning. When you're grocery shopping, it takes meal planning, which are good, good, good things to do and good habits and a, you know, a good way to live. But it's also, it requires a lot of work and a lot of energy. And there have been times in my life where I just did not have that goddamn energy to sit and look at broccoli and try to figure out how to make it exciting <laughs> or to try to convince myself that as much as I wanted this ice cream, it was not worth it to eat it because of what it would do to my body. It's exhausting. I have put my health on the back burner for a while because I haven't had the energy to give to it. So that's the nothing. When I'm in the all, I'm 100%, I'm in it to win it, excited about a diet, being on a diet, an eating plan, a new lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, requires a lot of mental and emotional energy from me because I cannot give it less than that because of how my brain works. This all or nothing hyper-focused thing that my brain does being in the zone or out of the zone, there's no halfway. So looking back on my life, I can see the patterns of where I was like all in on my diet. I was passionate about it. I was very strict with myself about if it's not one of these allowed foods, I cannot eat it because like I said, I was like all in, all my passion, all my energy was like in this diet. And I was gonna change my life and it was everything to me. And then when I left that diet, I didn't know what to do instead. So I just started kind of being like, oh, I was too strict on myself. Let me follow my impulses. And like me trying to be moderate (laughs) never worked. You know, life is always in flux. Sometimes I have a ton on my plate. Sometimes I have a lot less on my plate. And the thing is, 
I cannot live my life in a way where my physical health is reliant on my ability to devote attention to my food, my food prep, food planning, groceries, when everything else around me is feels like it's falling apart because I'm that stressed and I'm that concerned about money or politics or my job or my family. You know, there, when there's big, heavy life things going on, you know, I've hit my limit in terms of what stresses I can handle and eating for my entire life has been stressful in some way or another. Whenever I eat anything, there's always some sort of emotion or thought connected to that food, judging myself for eating it, whether it's in a good way of like, good job, you're eating something healthy, or in a bad way of like, you shouldn't really be eating this crap. I'm, I still have some sort of opinion about it. <laughs> At least for me, it really like increases my anxiety to be trying to moderate when I'm stressed out about much larger things in life and my anxiety is peaked, having to fight against not just the temptation of comfort food when I'm, ang when I'm anxious and when I'm stressed out, but also fight against the physical sensation of hunger, which I hate and I don't know why. Like I said, like I'm afraid of hunger. I don't know why that's a thing to figure out in therapy, but it's just something that makes me so anxious again. <laughs> to be hungry. And when you start eating less and you start moderating, then you feel hungry more. And do I have the willpower to deal with that? It's just an exhausting way to interact with food and really just an exhausting way to live. Habit forming is hard for me. There's too many factors before we even talk about how expensive healthy food is, how much time it takes to, to prep and meal prep and, and the opinions that marketing makes you have about different foods and like all of this different fucking shit. It's a war not against laziness. It's not a war against weakness or stupidity or anything like that. It's such a deep, complex issue weight loss, weight management, weight gain, whatever you're doing with food. Nothing is as simple as a lot of <laughs> health and fitness people like to make it sound. They're speaking in simplified terms because they're trying to reach a broad audience and because, you know, they're on TikTok, they have a very short period of time to say something. Even on YouTube, not a lot of people make very long YouTube videos like I tend to. So there's not a lot of time to go into a lot of nuance and talk about psychology and stuff, but I would argue... <laughs> If you're not going to talk about the psychology of weight loss and exercise, maybe you shouldn't talk about weight loss and exercise. Because in 2022, we cannot ignore this huge factor as to why people are fat and, and like why they have problems with food. And I haven't even talked about eating disorders yet. I'm not going to necessarily. For a minute, I was diagnosed with binge eating disorder, but then that goes away if you haven't done binge eating in a certain amount of time. She says after admitting to having a binge last night, which she is currently finishing today in this video. Yeah, I would say I still had some binge eating disorder tendencies at time of filming. Yeah, we haven't even talked about eating disorders and body dysmorphia and the media and, and like all of these different forces and influences that are constantly telling us information about how we look, especially about how much we weigh, mixed messages also, new fad diets, all that shit. It's always a topic on fat people's minds because America makes it a topic on our minds constantly. So we have to acknowledge these forces and factors at play. It's vulnerable. It's deep shit. Remember earlier on in this video when I was talking about how I was being defensive? Well, that comes back up again here as I address what I feel to be a common narrative that weight loss surgery is the easy way out or that it's done impulsively because people can't work hard enough or I don't know. Again, like I said, I was being defensive but also making clear why it was exactly the right choice for me. I'm getting surgery because I'm ready to start trying my damnedest to moderate. And I know that the best way for me to do that is to not have to deal with feeling hungry. Getting my stomach shrunk, going through this over five month process by the time it's all said and done, going through all of these appointments, having a at least 12 to like 13 or 14 item checklists of different tests and appointments and support groups I had to go to, changes I had to make to my diet, the therapy appointments, <laughs> the blood testing, vials and vials of blood. <laughs> 
EKG, like all of this stuff I had to do to qualify for the surgery, to prove that I could handle the surgery, to prove that I could handle life after surgery with the new eating plan, especially the month after surgery. You have to like, first you're just eating liquids and then you're just eating soft foods because your your stomach needs to heal after being torn asunder. <laughs> and then after that first month, you get into eating much more normally, but just small portions and prioritizing protein over everything else. Going through that process, it's invasive, it's vulnerable, it's talking about really deep, important things. It's reckoning with myself, reckoning with my weaknesses, my habits, my failures, my attempts at change. It's not easy to take this path. Thank God I work at a job where I actually can earn PTO and use my PTO because I've used almost all of it doing all the different doctor appointments that I needed to do. And then surgery in and of itself is dangerous. I mean, th this particular surgery is pretty safe, but for a lot of people, just the idea of going under the knife, no matter how safe a surgery is, there are a lot of reasons that people can't or would be afraid to, or maybe they can't afford to take the time off from work that's required after the surgery. Like, there's a lot of different obstacles in the way of getting the surgery. It's not a small thing to get a brand new stomach, basically. <laughs> Your stomach has to relearn how to digest food. It's insane. And my brain has to relearn how to interact with food. You can miss me with that, this is the easy way out shit. The only reason anyone would think that is if they've never tried this process before themselves. I'm gonna need to relearn who I am because being fat is part of my identity in a lot of ways, I'm realizing. We can talk about that next. I have my leftover Chinese from yesterday. The fact that there is leftovers is a victory. That's what I'm gonna have for lunch. I'm on my lunch break. As I mentioned, today is my last day being a fat woman, and there's a lot of identity behind that. And I wanted to talk about that. I started to this morning when I was doing my makeup at the beginning of this. I said that it felt like lopping off an arm <laughs> to get the gastric sleeve. Because basically what I meant is like it's something that's always been there. I'm not having it. Everything about you changes. You start to experience the world differently. People treat you differently. This is not a perfect analogy. <laughs> I guess I guess it works if if you had an extra third arm and you cut that off. I don't know. But there's a health side of weight loss, which I was talking about before. I'm doing this for the health benefits and to try to reclaim my youth instead of working my whole life and probably never achieving the results that I could achieve if I just got the surgery. I welcome this change. I welcome the health benefits that it will bring, but I'm also trepidatious, anxious, I don't know, about the societal part of it. I haven't told my parents about it, as I mentioned, or like my family really, besides just my sister and possibly my twin brother. I've told like one friend. I told you how I've always been fat since I was young. So it's always been part of my identity. And not having that anymore does feel a little bit naked. That, that's what I was thinking about yesterday when I was driving home from the surgeon's office, the final appointment, before I see him again for surgery. And I was thinking like, oh, I'm not gonna be fat anymore. <laughs> Not that I'm gonna lose every inch of fat that's on me, but I think that society will not perceive me as being fat the way that they do now. If anything, they might see me as thick, but definitely not the way that I am now. So like I said, I, I realized what a security blanket my weight has been for me and having this be part of my identity. My weight, weight loss, weight gain, weight struggles, talking about my weight with my friends and family, talking with each other about diets and exercise and bonding about weight struggles. Being as fat as I am in 2022, it's kind of a double-edged sword because there's a lot of othering. There's a lot of feeling different and feeling bad for being fat and feeling outcast and getting looks and feeling like you're getting judged and all that stuff. And a few fat phobic comments in my fucking, uh, in my comments. I see you bitches. If you're gonna comment on my weight, at least make it a good roast. Like I'm putting myself out there as a content creator, okay? Put yourself out there in the comments a little bit. Try something. 
have a little fun with it. Don't just be like, you're fat. Yeah, no duh, I'm fucking fat. And it's not an insult. It's a statement of fact. Tell me something I don't know, buddy. Anyway, yeah, there's a lot of fat phobia. There's a lot of issues with like, earlier this year I was in a wedding. I flew to South Carolina. I ended up going with Spirit Airlines. There were a few different airlines that were in around the same price point as Spirit, but Spirit has the big seats up at the front. <laughs> and the last time I flew on an airplane before this flight, I think I was in like a normal airplane seat, not like some special big seat or anything. And I felt tight, I felt squeezed. And you know, that was when I was a little bit thinner than I am now. So I was like, I don't wanna deal with that shit. And so I got the big seat on the Spirit Airline. I had to pay a little more for it. Thank God I didn't need a seatbelt extender, but I was like this close to needing one. <laughs> it's that kind of shit. The world is not made to accommodate fat people. I believe that it should be. It's just not right now. And right now is when I'm young, so I can't afford to wait around for systemic societal changes that are probably not gonna come until Gen Z gets to be my age. So it makes you feel different, it makes you feel big, it makes you feel bad for being big, it makes you feel othered. I don't wanna say oppressed because I'm, you know, I'm a straight white woman in America in 2022. I have a lot of privilege in that way, but my weight is one way that people other me, they're being fat phobic. At the end of the day, that is what it is, but I feel weird saying it, I guess, because I'm white. But it, there are a lot of inconveniences, there are a lot of experiences that I cannot participate in and enjoy because a lot of industries and environments are not built for people of size. And I'm not even getting to the fact that I'm tall. At the same time, 2022 is a great time to be a fat woman in America. I grew up with Ashley Graham as a role model. I grew up with plus size models being introduced and discussed on the Tyra show. <laughs> There's this growing movement for representation and inclusivity of all kinds, and especially a growing like sub movement or subsection of that movement that has to do with fat acceptance, body positivity, body acceptance, all of these things that I wish I had grown up with that would have given me a little bit more uh, self-esteem so there is community to be found out there. It's mostly online. I think like it's easier to find those people online. You can be my size and gain a following and gain some social media exposure and you can make your own success in a world that 10, 20 years ago would have been impossible. Even doing commentary, you know, something that has nothing to do with my weight would have been really hard for me to grow an audience. All of that complexity, all of that struggle and the emotions connected with it, the psychology connected with it, it's all part of my story. And I think what's weird is that today is the last day that that is all part of my present. Because starting tomorrow, it feels like at least it's going to be part of my past. Once I have this surgery, and I, you know, I have a lot of weight loss to go through. It's going to be a process. It's not going to be immediate. But once I have this surgery, I'm going to reach and maintain a much lower weight. And people are not going to look at me and think, boy, I bet she has struggled with weight all her life. What I'm weirded out by is the inevitable, what feels like erasure of almost 30 years of deep, complex, traumatic history with weight. Eating disorders, body dysmorphia, all of this stuff. Putting a definitive end date on that. It's just really weird for me. There will come a time when I will meet brand new people who will have no idea that I was anything other than an average weight, which is kind of what I'll end up being. So they might feel weird about me talking about weight issues. I might feel weird talking about them because I won't currently be in this body, but I'll remember being in this body. I guess it's like, as much as I want the problems of this body to go away, I'm not theoretically opposed to being big and having fat. It's that I don't want to have that limit my life and my lifestyle. In a way, it feels like giving in to what society wants, which is for fat people to get thin just because they don't like looking at fat bodies. But that's not why I'm doing it. In my heart, I know that. I'm doing it because my body hurts. But as a side effect, society will treat me better and that fucking sucks. And I hate that. The last time I had drastic weight loss, I was crash dieting. But the thing I hated most was people who had not talked to me ever 
um, this was during my college years, when I was going to a church that I had grown up at. They had like never talked to me or had only said hi in passing at church. And the first conversation they were ever having with me as an adult college-aged human was to compliment me on my weight loss. And I was like, you don't know me. You don't know anything about me. You don't know the struggle that I've gone through. You don't know what it took for me to get to this point. You're celebrating the result, but not the process. And I made a whole video about that on my channel too. Massive weight loss is a very visible kind of public change. So I understand people observing the fact that I had lost weight, but I couldn't put this into the words at the time, but it was very hurtful for all these people who had been there while I was growing up as a child and a teenager at church, who had never spoken a word to me for their first conversations to be about my body. And especially when it came from dudes at the church. First of all, it assumed that I wanted to lose weight as rapidly as I did, which sure I did, but they didn't know me. They didn't know what I wanted or what I was trying to do. For all they knew, <laughs> I had like worms or something, or I had a, a, a disease or a sickness or a reason that my body was shedding all this weight and I was not intentional. They didn't know, they just said, oh, good job, you've lost weight. It also implies that I was bad for being fat before I had lost weight. It also has more meaning than just good job, you've lost weight, or like you look good. It means I looked bad before, I was doing a bad job before, and really what they mean is, oh thank God, I can look at you now and not think about your weight, and not think about you, you're fat. Thank you for conforming to society. <laughs> Thank you for conforming to what I think is a good looking person. Thank you for changing yourself into what I want you to be and what society has conditioned me to think that you should be. Good job. I didn't have the words for it at the time, but it was strange. Like don't talk, don't comment on people's bodies. If they bring it up, that's one thing. But like for me, it's always a sign of my poor mental health when I'm gaining weight. I don't want to hear, oh, those pants are fitting you a little tighter. What I want to hear is, are you okay? How's your life? Are you stressed? Do you need help? Is there any way I can help you? And when I'm rapidly losing weight, when I go to my freshman year of college and in the second semester, I lose 50 pounds in one semester. It was a cry for help and I never got that help because people were happy to see me being thin. Don't comment on people's bodies that you don't know. If they've gained weight, don't assume it's a bad thing. Because for me, after I lost weight from crash dieting, after college when I first was regaining weight, it was because I was in a much better place mentally and I was allowing myself to gain curves and enjoy those curves. Also don't assume that if somebody is losing weight, that it's a good thing. There's different definitions of good and healthy. Some people stick to the physical. I look at things holistically. So sometimes the physical gets put on the back burner, but I would value my mental health over my physical health every goddamn day. Basically, don't assume things about people's bodies. Don't comment on them unless that person opens the door. And even then, maybe don't. Because well, why? Why do you need to? I know that that next phase of my life is coming with people commenting on my body on my weight loss, on my channels, and in person. And I'm dreading it with every fiber of my being. It represents so much more than people know. It's hard to describe, which is why this video is so fucking long. So this section got a little disorganized, but I guess you could say that that's reflective of my experience as a fat woman, especially one who has gone through a few different weight loss cycles. Disorganized, messy, emotional, confusing, frustrating, all of that good stuff. But I got to all the points that were weighing heaviest on my mind that day. So that was the last recording I took until it was time to wind down for the day. I'm back in my car because I just drove home. <laughs> um, I got two of my favorite comfort foods to have for dinner. One is Big Y pizza. I don't know where Big Y is, but I think it's like a small northeastern grocery chain. They make the best freaking pizza. It is a soft crust. It is not a thin crust, but for somebody like me who likes sugar and chewy bread, <laughs> this is the shit, man. And I also got an M&M McFlurry. 
These are two things that I grew up on. And yes, I did have ice cream already today, but I didn't have soft ice cream. I didn't have M&Ms. I didn't have an M&M McFlurry. So these are the two things that are basically going to cap off my, I don't know, all day binge, I guess. Big Y pizza is something that was present at like every birthday party, church event, whatever we did growing up. Cheap, yummy. So it's definitely one of the more nostalgic comfort foods for me. M&M McFlurries are also nostalgic for me. I think they came out while I was young and they were my favorite thing to get from McDonald's ever since then. And I've always loved similar things like blizzards from DQ or whatever else. So um, yeah, this is what I'm gonna have for dinner. And then tomorrow I start restricting <laughs> on keto. Tomorrow I'm gonna get my head in the game. Tomorrow it's all gonna be about no pain, no gain. What's the other phrase? What is the phrase I'm thinking of? I don't know what phrase I'm thinking of, but something else similar to no pain, no gain. That all starts tomorrow. Tonight, I'm exhausted, and I would just like to eat in peace and hang out with my boyfriend and think about my next chapter of life, I guess, uh, before I step into it. So thank you for watching this video. Thank you for listening to me ramble forever. And uh, I hope you found this interesting. Comment down below if you did. If you didn't, still comment down below because it helps my video. Thank you. So much love. Bye. I pour all of my energy into that task. I do a good job. Oh, fuck. Hold on. And I'd always make it. So I can list, oh, Jesus God. Oh shit, maintenance boys coming through. Just kidding. Matching, matching plaid shirts on. <laughs> I cannot wait until they get here and I can roast them for wearing matching flannels. Cut the fat ones down to size before the barricades arise. That's what they're doing to me. Um.